Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to the Dax Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. The shadow of the thin man is over. Why, it's the slickest detective work in 50 years. Hey, Nick. Hiya, Nick. Well, Nick, glad to see you. Hey, old man. How's it going, Nick? Had your dinner yet? Come on, Nick, join us. Hiya, Nick. Hold up, it ain't Nick Charles and the little woman. Nicky Pal, how's it? <laughs> Thanks, lady. Good night. Boy, oh boy, wait till I tell the family I met Nick Charles and Mrs. Charles. This is Mrs. Charles, isn't it? Now, that's the way we check in at motels. No one will get a word out of me, Nick. It's okay, honey. Okay, let's go. Uh-uh. Mama goes home. Oh, Nicky, you know you click better when I'm around. Uh-huh. Not in the men's shower. I'll tell you what. You go home, cold cream that lovely face, Slip into an exciting negligee. Yes. And I'll see you at breakfast. Stick him up or I'll blow you in two. Oh, don't shoot, Nicky. It's me. 
One thing about a murder case, if you just let people talk long enough, sooner or later, somebody spills the bean. Well, somebody has. Is it me? Yeah, Nick, is it her? Nick, who is it? I didn't go near the track that day, and I can prove it. And I haven't killed a jockey in weeks, really. <laughs> I have to talk that way now. Did you find the <laughs> lieutenant in this movie is the uh, is the model for the further adventures of Nick Danger Third Eye? <laughs> I suppose. Right? Like I suppose this I was that, that yeah. character. And how? Over and over and over again. I, I thought this is it. This is where they got it. Uh, Sam Levine is fantastic as the police lieutenant Abrams, and he definitely does have that vibe. And, and we saw him, they've been bouncing back and forth coast to coast because we yeah. saw him again, or we saw him previously and after The Thin Man when they're out in San Francisco. And now I don't they're think back. He leaned so heavily into this particular character. <laughs> Like, again, though, okay, so that's what we're doing. We're doing Shadow of the Thin Man, uh, William Powell, Myrna Loy. This time, W.S. Van Dyke II is also a major. Is this the first time he's a major? Well, that's... <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> is he just going to keep adding on every time? Like, what is? what are we going to see in the next Major film? General. <laughs> yeah, I'm like... <sighs> What are you doing? President W.S. Van Dyke. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I have to look now. Uh, his father was a Superior Court judge. Uh, let's see. Was he a major? Uh, yes. Van Dyke was commissioned a captain in the United States Marine Corps Reserve in 1934. On September 13th, 1935, he was promoted to the rank of major in the reserves. Prior to World War II, the patriotic Van Dyke set up a Marine Corps Reserve recruiting office in his own office at MGM. His rank of major often shows up in his later film credits, and he was influential in, in, in encouraging MGM stars to join the military during the early days of the war to include Clark, Clark Gable, James Stewart, and Robert Taylor. Fascinating. That yeah. is a fascinating bit of uh, uh, patriotic crediting. Very much so. I've never, I've never seen it before. Have you ever seen uh, a a creative use their military rank as a credit? I don't. I, I can't say for sure. I don't think so. But mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if there was something else out there, particularly in this period of time where people were wanting to show their support. Okay. Well. It's it was a funny thing to see, especially after our conversation last week, that he keeps adding <laughs> stuff to his name. Uh, so who knows what we're going to get next time. So how did this uh, how did this hit you? Just uh, quick right off the cuff. I enjoyed this one uh, quite a bit. I thought it had a better mystery than the last film. It uh, the humor was uh, definitely there more. William Powell, I think likely wasn't dealing with the health issues and the the heartache issues that he was dealing with during the last one he just seemed a little more vibrant you know i i still wish that there was a little more of actually nick and nora going out together although i get it it's called the thin man it's kind of nick's story but still uh you know i i really just enjoy them as a couple and it, on the whole i just i enjoyed this a lot more than another thin man but what about the next thin man did you enjoy it more than that you're just you, you mean random thin after man the thin man. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you still can't what, get the titles right. I love it. <laughs> uh, the I, I feel like there are two things of note in this movie. The first one is that uh, I I always assumed I don't know why, but uh, who is the thin man? I haven't read the books, but my understanding was the thin man was Nick Charles. See, that I haven't read the books either, but in this movie, for the first time, it's it feels like it's insinuating that this was a case where Nick was um, actually, um, oh, Nora's later, the, let's see, these are close to the ages of Nick and Nora, according to the Thin Man novel, where Nick mentions his age about 45, and then Nora's later in the novel to be 26. Thin Man was the name given to a third unused atomic bomb. Well, that's, What's that that's, all about? That's true history. That was Fat Man, Little Boy, and then Thin and Man? Thin Man, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but how so does that relate I, to the book? Was that... <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I don't be know. All that's, that's the thing that's very confusing to me. Like, who is the thin man? Because in this movie, they talk, the cop refers to the case that Nick Nora, or Nick worked on as the Thin Man case, as if the Thin Man is some sort of a criminal that Nick chased down and and solved that particular case. And so I'm with you. For the last three movies, I thought, oh, the Thin Man is referring to Nick and Nora. But I'm not sure that that's true anymore. And I think that is worth, uh, is worth resolving that the Thin Man was the case or the victim or something well uh, i mean i'm i'm reading about the book right now the 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 actual first book the thin man which uh doesn't sound like they pulled too much from the actual story for the first film and it does say nick charles is the narrator a one-time detective nora charles nick's wife a wealthy socialite asta which is interesting is a female schnauzer in the book and clyde wynant is the titular thin man. He is the wealthy eccentric inventor. Okay, so he so the thin man in the first film was the inventor who gets killed. Okay. And right. actually now that I now that we say that, I do feel like in the credits was there shadow play in the opening that made it seem like the thin man might be who he was after or something? I can't remember, but but that really doesn't make any sense. So then is every film is the idea of the thin man I, I don't know. It's weird. It just it almost becomes a name that means nothing other than yes. the story thread with Nick and Nora Charles. Yeah, that the thin man ref- is just shorthand for a Nick and Nora Charles mystery, but he is not the thin man. Nobody is the thin man anymore. It's just when they're covering, <laughs> when they're doing mysteries like this, it's just the thin man mysteries, and that's mystery. Yeah, that That's what I get. The other thing about this movie, which I think is interesting to me, it has so far, here we are, movie four, the cutest scene of Nick and Nora as a couple to me. I was oh. joyous at this particular scene, and I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. See if you can figure it out, and let's well, do something else. I'm going to take a moment to, think, to figure it out. While I say that Shadow of the Thin Man, when it was released in 1941, it passed. <laughs> That's right. That was this is the area, era where things, they, they just pass. In yeah. fact, you look at <laughs> how people have reviewed it on IMDb. Sex and nudity, mild. Violence and gore, mild. Profanity, none. Alcohol, drugs, and smoking, mild. Frightening and intense scenes, none. Look at that. Very um, safe. Very safe. Recovering alcoholic drinking milk at the dinner table. <laughs> Extreme. <laughs> Okay, so you asked me the cutest moment between Nick and Nora. I did. It, um, what would that be? I'm trying to think of a moment between the two of them. I, I doubt this is it, but I really did enjoy their banter when the cop pulled them over. Like the way that they, <laughs> yeah, the way that their sure. conversation unfolded with her just needling him a little bit about his driving and stuff. Uh, I, I found that to be a delight, especially as the cop continued to give him a ticket, even as he was trying to work his way out of it. It was like, that was just a delight. I really enjoyed that. And then proceeded well, to drive <laughs> to escort uh, them to the track going incredibly slow. Like that whole thing was that was great. And and the, the, you're absolutely right. The banter is amazing when he says, this is Mrs. Chase. That's how we check into motels. Uh, I thought was so great. Like, and that's something that I think, you know, this is, this was not uh, ha- our, our favorite uh, screenwriting duo, uh, Hatchet and what's, what's her name? Uh, Francis and I've forgotten their names. Anyway, yeah. they wrote the last three I, movies and their dialogue was fantastic. Um, this one is, uh, Irving Brecker and Harry Kernitz, uh, based again on Dashiell Hammett, who at this point did not own the rights to the character. So I believe he, at this, is that, 
my understanding is that well, it was based, or did, yeah, that it was was based on the characters purely. Yeah. And then it was a story right. by Harry Kernitz that, that he came up with this entirely. So yes, other because, than the characters, there's nothing Hammett related to the story. I yeah. don't know about the rights to the characters, but I wouldn't be surprised. No, because he had Hammett. sold that he, he'd gotten too drunk and sold the rights to MGM so they could do whatever they wanted with the characters. And I think it was by this point. Um, and so he got, he got a $40,000 payout and let it go. So I don't think he had anything to do with any of the characters by now. And in the last movie, he did do the setup for the, the mystery and such and so. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I, I think actually the banter holds up the you're absolutely right. The shot of the them being passed by the both lanes of traffic as they're trailing the, the police motorcycle is awesome. Fantastic. Brilliant yeah. visual comedy uh, that is still not the cutest moment in the movie. Is it when she, <laughs> it's definitely not this either, but this also made me laugh when he is in the park with Junior, a uh, little Nicky, and he's <laughs> and his son is just like, oh, dad, just read the read the uh, track stats or whatever. Yeah, the page right. is called. <laughs> right. And so he's reading it and she's been watching and then suddenly he stops. And he's like, I think something's, I think we have to go somewhere. And like, she's using like the shaky of a, of a martini shaker as like a telepathic lure to draw him home. Racked me up. That was brilliant. so funny. Yep. So brilliant. I, again, I doubt keeps, that's it, but I really enjoyed it. That is also not it. Uh, but you're absolutely right. And what, what a brilliant little like, like lightning joke to keep to keep us thinking broadly about the kind of comedy this is. The, but I have to go back even a step further that it opens with him, that scene opens with him walking with a leash. And we know he always has a leash because he walks Asta all the time. And right. he gets kind of caught up because the leash tightens and it it pulls back to reveal <laughs> that <laughs> little Nicky is now uh, dressed as like a full bird colonel. <laughs> Right. And he's he's up and talking. I mean, how old do you think he is, little Nicky, at this point? Four oh, or five? Four or five, yeah, I would say. That. Yeah. And he, little Nicky, is attached to Nick's leash, and little Nicky is walking the dog. So it's kind of a, a double leash situation. And uh, little Nicky is, I think, uh, fantastic. He is a little is a little kiddo. I think he does, does a, just a great, great job. Very funny. Still Very not funny. the cutest moment. Between Nick and Nora. Goodness. Oh my goodness. One more chance. One more chance. I don't know. You're just going to have to tell me. So I didn't know this at the time, but it turns out, Andy, that going to wrestling events was a real (laughs) date night. Oh. And according to some, it still is. It's, it, some would say Nick and Nora use a press pass, one of their journalist buddies' press pass, and they go get their tickets to go to the to see the wrestling match. And there are, a, it's just a very fancy kind of thing. Uh, she wears her fancy spiral hat, and they sit down to watch the match. And as the match is going, she can't control herself and starts putting Nick in kind of an unconscious, like subconscious headlock <laughs> next to her. And her face and his face, it's just overwhelmingly adorable to me andy like that is a great context a great set a great setting everything works for me and she just crushes being adorable on him by wrestling him and not knowing it i love it i love it that is that is peak nick and nora for me so far wow okay i would not have picked that moment is it because you just can't, you don't agree, you don't like that scene, and you oh. resent me for picking it? Or it's just a surprise? <laughs> None of that. Um, no, I liked the scene. I, it was very funny watching them uh, in the wrestling, uh, watching the wrestling match. I, I just, it, like, to me, that was, it was a fun scene. It just wasn't, like, one of their cutest moments that they've had. I, I think that there are a lot of dialogue moments. Like, for me, I, I, really love those moments where they come together as a couple and uh i don't know just like when in the last film when he came over to the table surrounded by all the guys thinking that it was this former lover of his to find that it was her and they just connect and like i don't know there are just a lot of moments like that that i really i just enjoy those moments between the two of them as they uh as they have their the little connections so 
Well, and I agree with you. I would say in a movie of wonderful little connections between the two of them. And I think that's one of the things that is always at risk when I turn on these movies now is how are they going to handle the relationship between Nick and Nora? And I feel like I can say, having seen this movie now, that I think they did it justice. Yeah. I still feel like we got the same thing. Now, I do think on the the other hand, it is the same relationship with Nick and Nora with an older child, and it's just sort of frozen in time. So I get what I'm, what we're getting with Nick and Nora and that my expectation for what I get for their relationship is exactly what it is. And accepting that, it's fine. It's really fun and funny and light, and I enjoy it. Yeah, I agree. I kind of wish think... he was still drinking more. I liked him as a little well, bit he, of a drunk. I felt like he was drinking more in this film, and I don't know if they portrayed it specifically but the fact that he was getting so dizzy on the merry-go-round when mm-hmm. he was challenged by all the little kids to ride on the ride on the dragon I mean, it's it's funny because he didn't have any problem standing there next to little Nikki as they were riding the, the merry-go-round but as soon as he hops up onto the the thing himself and rides he is so dizzy and uh, can't see straight uh, that it was it was kind of comical, but it made me think, okay, so is he actually drunk or is he just this weak when it comes to a merry-go-round? Well, I was confused by what they were trying to tell me there about him because they were the, the parallel shot structure was to cut away to Asta, who was having a miserable time on the <laughs> uh, thing as a dog. And the final payoff to that little visual joke was Asta hugging a fire hydrant, which I thought was hysterical. Um, like really funny bit of dog manipulation there there was i think this film so far is the peak of asta comedy like yeah. there were so many dog gags shot with undercranked cameras that speeds up asta's motions just all over the place and it, like it was <laughs> it was kind of comical that they were using asta in such a strong way to drive the comedy for the story and i don't know if that's like have they realized by this point that kids love the stories too and so they're amping up the asta to really give us more of that comedic bit or or what because it it was a lot it It very much was pervasive through the film do you think that by this point they're starting to wonder about asta's age because part of what like I, i was wondering there was so much undercranking of asta that it was um, th- th- that there was some potential that they were worried that Asta was aging out of being able to look as agile as the dog was in the first movie. <laughs> I mean, that's entirely possible. I mean, you know, the first one was, what, 34? Uh, and now we're 41. And so, you know, that's in dog years, Asta's really getting up there in age. So, Yeah, yeah. But, and, and this is yeah. the fourth to the last of Asta's credits. Uh, only three more movies after this, including The Thin Man Goes Home um, in 44. And I think that was kind of near the end. Well, is he not in uh, Song of the Thin Man? Not credited. Yeah. So this this may be, um, yeah, maybe, uh, I don't know. I'm curious to this see what will happen the, by the time we get to that one. The Thin Dog Goes Home. You know what I mean? Oh, Wink oh. to a farm upstate. That's just terrible. Yeah. So, sad. so I, I agree with you that the dog humor is great. Now, I, I feel like coming directly off the last movie, we both had some struggles with the construction of the actual mystery and the reconstruction uh, of uh, and how satisfying that reconstruction is after watching it and talking about it. How did you feel about the mystery overall? And once again, again, we should say these movies are too hard not to spoil. So we're going to spoil it. We continue to spoil it. We're going to talk about specific points and uh, go watch the movie if you haven't seen it. Starting yeah. now. So tell me what you thought of the mystery. I liked the mystery. Like I, I thought that it was a good mystery. Like I understood all the little bits and pieces as far as what they were putting together. We had a dead jockey at the start uh, at the track. So that that kind of kicks things off as... Uh, Lieutenant Abrams is trying to solve the crime as to who done it. Then we get to this reporter who gets killed and uh, kind of in a way where this other reporter, uh, the one who Nick and Nora are friends with, he gets, um, that's Paul, he gets um, accused of the murder. 
And uh, then we're trying to figure it out from there. And I enjoyed the way that all of the mystery played out. By the time we got to the resolution as to the who done it, I was like, oh, really? Like it just it was kind of a surprise the way that the the resolution happened because I was just like, well, that he was hardly in it to a point where I just didn't feel I don't know. I, I guess I just ended up feeling like, well, that was a little bit of a disappointing reveal. That's kind of where I ended up with the mystery, even though I liked the mystery itself. Yeah, because I think all the major set pieces were good. And I don't think we had any uh, to, to my eye. I don't think we had any circumstances like the mass last movie where we had people sneaking in through the window behind him that we thought was stupid. We didn't have any of the the kind of hijinks of like, let's lock the person in the uh, in their in the bedroom. Uh, yeah, to get right. him out of the way for a little bit, shedding light on, you know, who might be the the particular suspect. In this case, I think you're right. I feel like economy of character, I was able to pick it like right before he said it. I was like, I, I think it's they're going to twist it and make it an, uh, an authority. They're going to make it, you know, one of the like they're going to make it this guy the well, i don't know what was his Ma- major his scully right yeah major scully they're going to make him the he's major the, he's a he's a state assemblyman yeah the problem i had with it was that as that scene performatively as nick is accusing him and going through the entire like the litany of uh events that led to that point where the major would have been involved the way the major portrays it he was a stoic for too long and it felt like there was he never felt like there was a sense of threat to him and so that confrontation felt like they're setting it up that nick is a buffoon here like there there is a there is one possible ending where this is ultimately dissatisfying because nick is just straight wrong i never got a sense that any that anybody but nick was committed to this ending and it it ended on a bit of a whimper it was it was just kind of a bit of a peculiar twist that's like, yeah, that's because I, I mean, I think about it now and I'm still like, OK, well, even I mean, I just watched the movie and yeah. I'm still going, oh, wait, why did why was what was his whole reason? <laughs> like, it just comes across as tepid, like the the reasoning just doesn't feel like there's a lot of logic to what he was doing. You know, well, and the reasoning was because. The major had said that he'd gone over to this apartment on one given day a week ago, but the person moved. And so the major wouldn't have known <laughs> where the the place was if he hadn't been there to murder them. <laughs> Something yeah. like that. It has everything to do with the fact that the victim moved a unit um, at seven o'clock the night before. And that was that was the final phone call that Nick had gotten. Um, right before the big reveal in the giant in the room full of potential perps, yeah, and it 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 did. You're you're absolutely right. That was the thing that just felt tepid. It didn't feel like I'm going to really land this blow. I guess the the logic or what was going on in the story is Major Scully, who was doing the investigation on this gambling um story that had mm-hmm. you know he was working with Paul to uncover what was going on at the track and to weed out the bad guys but in reality he's helping the bad guys and whitey was the reporter who knew and so he kills whitey and then is basically he's and that's essentially the story like that's as complex as it goes the the jockey as we find out which is actually kind of funny i really enjoyed this whole bit is the jockey accidentally killed himself he was Great. <laughs> trying to hide his gun in a yeah. drain and he dropped it and the gun went off and shot him and he died <laughs> which i mean it's horrible but it's funny the way that it's and then the way that it, that nick uses it because he and lieutenant abrams are the only two who know that and so they're able to make everybody think that somebody killed this jockey and now somebody also killed whitey and and so basically what Scully is doing is he's trying to frame Rainbow Benny as the person who killed both of them to get away with all of it. And that's it, it just ends up being like, I don't know, I guess I 
I felt like this one was a lot less complex than the other ones. And even in the other ones, it felt like, okay, this is a bad guy doing some bad things. But also, Nick finds out, well, you know, Aunt Catherine is also you know, doing some shady things. And these other people are doing some shady things. And, and kind of getting a sense that there's a lot of people doing bad things. But this one person is actually killing people. And I've now solved the crime. In this one, it's just like, yeah, you did it. And that's it. <laughs> it's like, oh, is this okay. the first one where they've actually made it an authority figure? I can't remember. Who, what was the role of the person who did it yesterday? No, it was the last. Well, week? it depends on what you call an authority figure. But in the very first film, it was the guy that the inventor's lawyer. Right. I, I don't know. It's not really an authority figure, but, you know. And then in the second film, it was uh, Jimmy Stewart because he was it was a love issue. The third film, it was the daughter. She wanted the money. Right. And now we have this guy. But this guy is the is, I think, the closest to. So he's an assemblyman, but he also is like working with the police and doing this investigation. Yeah. And I like, feel like right. that he's is like the politician who's behind. We're going to clean this town up. Yeah. Sort of thing. Right. And that, I think, is an interesting thing, because this is this is the first one in the series where it's made it a a like a public figure is the criminal. It's not a criminal who's a criminal or a jilted lover who's a criminal. Uh, their motivation is, you know, whatever it is. This is we're going to take somebody who is at, like even closer to like a corrupt cop and we're going to make them we're going to make them bad. Um and I think that's part of the reason that it was it was hard to land that. And I wonder if that has anything to do with like the way they write in the Hayes era. Like what are the what are the what were the limitations in that statute of making an authority figure a criminal? Uh, I need to look it up while you think about that. Well, uh, yeah, I, I'm definitely curious about that. Uh, although I, I guess in some sense you know, they are saying, hey, if you're an authority figure and you're getting involved in crime, you deserve to be caught. And, yeah. I mean, right. That could be as far as what they're saying. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I don't it was an authority figure, but it's not like it was any military person. I feel like at this particular point in time, I mean, it's, it's right before Pearl Harbor. So I don't think it was necessarily like they needed to be patriotic. It couldn't be like a military person. but. Uh, but I would imagine that that's going to affect the later films. Actually, what happens because of Pearl Harbor right after this, uh, I mean, Myrna Loy goes off and volunteers with the Red Cross. All these actors are like going off and volunteering in the war efforts. Um, and I mean, Myrna Loy doesn't make another movie until the next Thin Man entry in 45. So it's definitely going to be a change between this film and the next film as far as, um, you know, how everybody seems to be and, and what's their opinion. Uh, what their viewpoints are. But I don't know. I, I guess I don't think I can't think of anything that would make me think there was something about that in particular. This is the only thing it says specifically to that to that point. Um, be it further resolved that special care be exercised to the manner in which the following subjects are treated to to the end that vulgarity and suggestiveness may be eliminated and that good taste may be emphasized in titles or scenes having to do with law enforcement or law enforcing officers. This is between the use of drugs and excessive or lustful kissing. So you get an idea of where those things <laughs> fall in priority. My. Like good taste in law enforcement or law enforcing officers, which I think is another like potentially another strategic reason or narrative reason not to make him an actual police officer, but yeah, rather right. working with the police as an investigator. That's interesting to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about the rest? I mean, do you like the surrounding bits of the crime? Like we have the different people who are at the track. There's the reporters. There's Whitey, who is the shady reporter uh, who's always trying to get uh you know, Paul, like it right at the beginning, I'm like, okay, there's definitely going to be something with the reporters because you have Paul, all the reporters at the scene of the crime and Paul's taking pictures and Whitey is trying to like get him to share his pictures. And they, there's clearly an, an antagonistic relationship between the two reporters. So I'm like, okay, well, something's going on here. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think there is there there definitely is a story in here about how uh, about the the interpretation of the media and the use of media. And we have some reporters that are used for good and some that are used for ill, and they duke it out uh, often, sometimes in the pages, sometimes in the back rooms at the track. And I I think that's interesting. Like the the worldview is not necessarily positive when looking at the the media, the news, and um and and so. You know, to my eye, it also is is pretty balanced because we had two reporters and one of them feels good and one feels bad. It's a little bit black hat, white hat. And um, and so, you know, uh, it, at least it's not wholly dirty, dirty journalist story uh, because we've had those and, you know, they have their own special place. But I like the fact that this one is is actually a, this is a. a I, I think this is interesting. So that's one angle. I like it a lot. I particularly like that track scene. And you you brought up the, you know, he shot himself because he was hiding his gun. That is so perfect for me. That whole sequence and discovery is perfect for me because it's the setup to one of those those perfect riddles that goes around when your kids are in like middle school. Like, oh, you know, you're you, you, the kind of thing you're that someone hung himself and there's there's nothing in the room and no furniture in the room and what was it and you find out it's a block of ice right like those kinds of riddles i think are so fun and this movie just gave us one with the gun in the drain the the old gun in the drain pipe hey eh? like it i i thought it was <laughs> just a, a perfect setup so that bit and the way it moved through the bits to the major sequences where we go through the wrestling match, we go to the merry-go-round, which was fun and a little bit anemic, but good comedy. And then the giant fight in the restaurant, which was a great sequence. Um, so all of those leading up to it maybe were distracting me from the fact that the mystery wasn't going to lead to a satisfying resolution uh, in, in the form of, you know, uh, accusing Major Scully. But I was okay with it this time because I felt like I was sufficiently distracted by lightweight, big set pieces. Well, and, you know, uh, they did some nice um, intercutting also, like when Nick and Nora are at the wrestling match, we're also jumping back and forth to the stuff going on behind the scenes at the wrestling yeah. match. We've got, uh, well, when, when they show up, we meet McGuire, who's the ticket guy, who's the one who kind of hears some information and and uh, gives them the information later. You have Macy, who's kind of the, I don't know, the shady guy at the track, but he seems to be friendly with Nick to some capacity. And then Link, who seems to be the guy who owns the arena and is mm -hmm. the main one who's running this gambling racket. Uh, and then there's also right. his girlfriend, uh, Claire, who, you know, comes to be an important character as things, uh, as things move. So... Like meeting those characters as we're intercutting back and forth with the wrestling match and everything going on there. I mean, I just felt like uh, Van Dyke managed the story quite well as far as keeping things, keeping the pace moving, um, making sure we understood these characters. Like I just, I felt like I understood these characters largely a lot better than the last film and the motivations and everything uh, until that moment with the major at the end, I was just like, well, that just seemed kind of an anemic resolution to this yeah. mystery. Um, but well, otherwise I, mean, I, I enjoyed these characters. Yeah. I think that's a, I think that's a, uh, it's a good way to look at it. And, and I would compare it, I think to the, the mayhem and chaos that we have with the baby party in the last movie. We had none of that in this movie, none of that sort of just super lightweight, like let's use kids for the laughs. And I rented a baby, which I thought was, kind of charming in the last movie like i was fine with it but i noted that it was absent here that every one of the characters even when they're sitting in the audience and who was it he was sitting next to was that spider web or was yeah. spider web <laughs> in the hallway i can't remember i think um, spider web was who they were sitting next to yeah and and he was the one who was who went to prison because he was framed and it was just coincidental that he was guilty, which I i love those bits like we get those minutes. So we still get all the texture of the Nick Charles kind of, uh, you know, network. Uh, but it all feels sort of relevant, like more relevant than the last movie did. I think that's that's important. I there, There's definitely something to that. I, even like when I like how Nick is so well known that he seems to have somehow touched every criminal who he comes into contact with and they all seem to respect him which cracks me up but that's kind of the, the relationship with rainbow benny and because we get a sense that there is this there's this past relationship between the two of them he has that conversation with rainbow at the at the restaurant when before the brawl breaks out 
And that's where he finds out that Rainbow Benny is so terrified that, you know, that he's seen something. He's, you know, they know he knows somebody is after him. He's wearing a bulletproof vest. He's shaking like there's definitely something going on. So they're they're setting up interesting things with these characters. And I like how Nick just seems to have his finger on the pulse of the underworld, even though he is living this uh, hoity-toity life with Nora. I, I, I enjoy that about the way that his character comes across. Do you remember how famous Nick was in the first movie? He was, uh, I thought he was pretty famous still, but I don't think, because it's the first film, I think it takes that case to kind of get him to this place where everybody's saying that about him. Well, I think that's my, that is my question. Like, how much of the first film is the origin story of Nick Charles? Or do we just sort of jump into his career at a point where he's already an established detective and it's been long enough since we watched the first movie that i i don't quite remember where he was in the hierarchy well i mean it's definitely the same thing where all these criminals are still recognizing him and talking to him and yeah and you know and it's always that same thing where nora is always looking at them like oh how nice you know as nick is introducing them so there's definitely still that in the first film but as we talked about in uh last week's episode the police officer in that film was like kowtowing to Nick constantly in uh, another thin man. Whereas in the first film, it was a little bit more of that back and forth relationship. Like, I don't know. I don't know, buddy. You know, I, I don't want this detective prowling around with me. And and he seems to have a little bit more of like they needed that relationship to be a little more uh, butting heads in the first mm-hmm. film. And I liked that in the first yeah. film. And so, that hadn't gotten to the point where it was yet. Yeah, and we don't have that really at all here, right? In fact, the and the and what was an antagonistic relationship occasionally with the police, but it's sort of smoothed out over the last few movies. The last movie, it was all antagonistic with the private security guards at the estate, uh, yeah. at the Colonel Mustard's estate. <laughs> I don't remember <laughs> his name either. Um, but now... His relationship with Sam Levine, Sam Levine is a, a full on like buffoon. He is the buffoon in this movie. He doesn't understand it. He is actually becomes a complete puppet for, um, you know, for uh, yeah. Nick. But he's not. He, but he doesn't kowtow to Nick like the uh, the detective. No, you're the, right. The, he, yeah. he, he's not fawning. He's just no. not. It, I, I think the question is, is he competent as a. Well, that's a good officer, question because lieutenant. He, He's jumping the gun on every single decision Everything. he makes. He's like, well, we got that wrapped up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And Nick's like, mm, do you really? In the drain. How'd you know to check there, Nick? Yeah. Like, uh, although I of- will say at least he tried to keep his men in line because his men were the ones who were always like fawning over Nick every time yeah. they they came across him. Oh, it's Nick Charles. Oh, my gosh, Nick. And then, and Lieutenant Abrams was always like, "Hey, what's all this going?" He's the one, like you said in um, uh, uh, the Adventures of Nick Danger. You know, what's all this brew ha ha? Brew ha ha! Like he just <laughs> yeah. seems like the guy right. who's coming in to say all that. Well, that was one of their first meetings. Nick goes in and says, "Hey, do you have any? Do you have an in with the police? <laughs> I got some pretty <laughs> good connections. Good because they're all over my car and I can't get out. Like that's uh, <laughs> that's one of those things I think was really like I I found that uh, it's it's fun and charming for a time, and then there's a part of it that just removes potential conflict from the story, and and I need Nick to be able to overcome more stuff." Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it feels like he doesn't have enough sort of threshold guardians to move him to the next whatever in the story. It's all fairly linear and fairly easy for him because he doesn't have a lot of people who are standing against him leading into the big reveal. And maybe well, that's, that's a that's a concern I have with the whole sort of, you know, story is that the, all of the Thin Man movies, there's a little bit of that. Well, uh, but to a certain extent, I feel like it's gotten worse as they've progressed where yeah. you you need those red herrings to be antagonistic toward your detective as he's trying to solve stuff. Not necessarily because they did it, but because there's something else that they were involved in that they don't want Nick to uncover. And that's something that I think worked a lot better, like in that second film, where there were a lot of things, a lot of people doing a lot of things. And by the time Nick 
solves the crime. He's also saying, well, you also did this and you also did this. You were embezzling money. You were forging checks. And everybody was kind of bad. And you kind of need that for Nick to be going up against you know, the criminal element. And in this film, it seemed like the only bad people were really the gambling, uh, the people running the gambling ring. And uh, it just happens to be this one officer who, or this one, you know, assemblyman who's trying to stop the process from stopping the gambling because he's actually involved. And that's it as far as like bad people, like even the first murder, it was accidental. So you just don't end up, and, and I mean, uh, Claire, the girlfriend, her whole thing is just, you know, she's being blackmailed or Whitey is being blackmailed because he owes money to to Rainbow and she is trying to and he's using her to try getting money from um, from her boyfriend. And it's really because he knows that she's actually a, a former criminal and stuff. So, I mean, there's some bad stuff that's going on, but nothing that seems like all those bad people like it's Whitey and he ends up dead. <laughs> it's just yeah. like, well. You you need those those bad people to be kind of antagonistic toward your hero through the course of the film, so that it feels like you know a, there's a more mystery here. Well, and I, to that very point, I felt like like we were going to use the evil media more effectively as an antagonist for Nick in this in this story because they always that's one of the sort of tropes of the Thin Man is they always have the shot of the paper being thrown onto the curb, the stack of bound papers, and it shows the headline, you know, of whatever Nick is working on or whatever his last great save was. And I felt like, oh, this is going to be one where maybe they actually make Nick kind of go up against his own reputation. And yeah. that would be awesome. That would be a great way to include uh, a great line to include in this movie, in these this series is just make it make it a little hard for him, like put him up against something. This guy is a hero from jump in this movie. And he's charming and funny. And his relationship with his wife is amazing. And I, I I'm here for all of that. But really, from a story structure perspective, it's not great. Like it doesn't make for a really like multivariate textured protagonist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we also have to deal with the not so bright African American uh, maid, which I was a little Sigh. disappointed that we ended up having to deal with that trope by the time we got to this film. For that sure. was frustrating. You know, when she's trying to come up with you know telepathic, and she just can't come up with the word because. No, so what was the what did she say at the end? It was something like telephonic, like oh, it's just something, a, yeah, yeah, just hard just, to read. that was that hard was very frustrating, to. yeah, so frustrating, yeah. You know, I you know, I wonder, I and who knows how uh, who, you what the experience was of of Kernitz and Brecker writing this script, but to hear Goodrich and Hackett, Francis Goodrich and Albert Hackett talk about it, um, you know, Goodrich said that that they got to the point where they the two of them were having a nervous breakdown together that they started talking about here they press you awfully hard there when they started talking about another thin man we started throwing up and crying into our typewriters so they quit um and that's why they're not on this movie um it it uh, I don't know if it's if what we're missing is the um uh, is the the benefit of having the you know a writing duo that is also partnered uh write this thing and maybe we would have more Myrna Loy kind of serving in the, a, a more balanced role uh, in the couple that would give him more to jump through. I don't know if that's one potential way out, um, but it, it, that, that's where it feels like structure might have been weakened. As things are wont to do, you know, people leave, people come in, and you end up with different hands. And yeah, it does feel a little different. But I do think at least at the core at this point, we still have W.S. Van Dyke helming it. We still have um, uh, Powell and Loy as the core characters. And I think they know what to bring to the screen as far as these particular characters are concerned. It just boils down to the rest of the team being able to figure out, okay, well, now we have to build a story around these characters. And, and that's where the strengths and weaknesses are generally going to lie. Yeah. Um, I do think uh, Powell looked better. We, we talked about his... Uh, yeah cancer last time uh his struggle to shoot his uh, the fact that he just he didn't quite look himself and i think he looked better stronger um you know even as these these actors are getting older uh he looked much more sort of able in this movie than he did in the last to me 
Yeah, for sure. We haven't really mentioned um, Hunt Stromberg. He was the producer of these first four uh, Thin Man films. This is the last one that he is going to do. And uh, he was one. He had been with MGM since twenty five, and was one of the main executives, uh, uh, one of the big guys at the company. And actually, this is interesting. He was the first production supervisor to get a produced by credit on screen. So really, um, yeah. So well, that is interesting. Uh, he did all of the um, Thin Man series. I, I, I don't. I, for some reason, I thought he didn't do any more after this film so maybe i'm wrong i guess we'll see as we get to the next few he apparently produced all of gene harlow's films he did joan crawford's breakthrough films uh, greta garbo's first american film he did the nelson eddie and jeanette mcdonald operetta cycle and also produced uh big things like the great Ziegfeld, marie antoinette the women pride and prejudice so um yeah very busy very important uh part of mgm what a crazy production house that was. Yeah, at the peak of their producing, they were doing 52 films a year. So one a week. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is crazy that they were cranking that much content out. Yeah. What else you got? Anything? Nope, I think that's it. So uh, we'll be right back. But first, our credits. The next reel is a production of True Story FM, engineering by Andy Nelson, music by Avner Kelmer, Oriel Novella, and Eli Catlin. Andy usually finds all the stats for the awards and numbers at v-numbers.com, boxofficemojo.com, imdb.com, and wikipedia.org. Find the show at truestory.fm, and if your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, please consider doing that for our show. I don't know. Awards? I'm going to guess <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah. Were the golden yeah. raspberries out yet in, in the right. 40s? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's it's interesting. Um, like, I, I, I need to do some uh, digging on different um, different awards to figure out when they were starting. Because, I mean, at this point, I think largely it was still just the Oscars. You know, there might be a few small things out there. Like, I don't, I don't even know if like the DGA or uh, some of those um, organizations had their own awards yet. And so, I don't know. Uh, Golden Raspberries, just so you know, uh, they started 1981. So a long time after this film. This film had no award nominations of any kind. Okay. Well, how much money did it make? Well, the Mannix Ledger, again, proves a big help here. Uh, Van Dyke's budget dropped for this one, actually, uh, smartly, considering the last one's increase did not lead to an increase in ticket sales. The budget was $821,000, or $14.3 million in today's dollars. The movie opened November 21st, 1941, opposite Look Who's Laughing, Skylark, and They Died With Their Boots On. It went on to earn $2.3 million or $40 million in today's dollars. That is just a hair under what the last one earned. But because this one had the smaller budget, it had a better profit margin and an adjusted profit per finish minute of nearly $266,000. Is, is this the shortest one of the set so far? It felt shorter to me. At 97 minutes, this one. I think the one before it was uh, two hours. Uh, let's see. Shadow of the Thin Man, 97 minutes. The Thin Man, 91 minutes. Oh, okay. All right. After the Thin Man, 112 minutes. Another Thin Man, 103 minutes. The Thin Man Goes Home, 100 minutes. Song of the Thin Man, 86 minutes. There we go. That's so the that... kind of movie I'm talking about right there. <laughs> Let Andy stay awake through one single watch. There we go. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, I, I'm still, I'm still in it. This isn't my favorite one, but I'm definitely still in it. And this didn't, uh, this didn't, I, I think I like this one. I'll, I'll tell you, I think I like this one better than the last one. I and definitely three. like this better than the last one, but, uh, it, but still the first two are my favorite. I think right now I would say after the thin man, the thin man, shadow, the thin man, another thin man for my order preference. You think after the thin man is your favorite. Yeah, the second one. Interesting. I, you said it was yours too. 
Did I? Yeah, I'm surprised. Because you said that to me. You, you said don't that remember to me. The names. It, <laughs> you're right. That's actually that's actually because you said it to me. I was like, "Wow, that is an epiphany." I think I agree with Andy, and I was surprised. But now you're telling me I've already had that thought before. <laughs> you have. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> After the thin man, the thin man, shadow of the thin man, another thin man. That's yep. what we're saying. All that's right. That's what we're saying. We'll be right back for our ratings, but first, here's the trailer for next week's movie, the next in the series, The Thin Man Goes Home. nicest thing you've said to me since the time I got my head caught in that cuspid at the Waldorf. That wasn't the Waldorf. That was the Aster. Aster? Aster! All animals must go in the baggage car. Oh, that isn't an animal. That's my fur coat. If it can wag its tail, it goes in the baggage car. I, I wonder if I might come in for a minute. There's something. around and guzzle cider. Now, Swiss prune juice. You have to have someone who could operate freely and without arousing suspicion. Someone who knew Peter Burton and could get him to do the work for you. When we find who that individual was... Nick! Look out! <laughs> Letterbox, Dandy. You know Letterbox. Oh, Letterbox, you old clown. It's our favorite social network for movie lovers. If you love movies and you write reviews of your own movies and you rate them and you like to track your log or log the movies that you watch when you watch them, you should just join us over at letterbox.com. You can just find our profile at the letterbox at the letterbox letterbox.com slash the next reel. Andy is uh, Soda Creek Film. I'm Pete Wright. Feel free to follow us over there. Uh, and uh, if you fall in love with it like we have, you can save 20%. Uh, as you upgrade your membership there to pro or patron, just visit thenextreel.com slash letterboxed and it will whisk you over to letterbox checkout page with the 20% already applied. If you skip that and you just happen to be at letterbox, just remember next reel, next reel, enter that code at checkout and you can knock that 20% off there too. So, all right, Andy, what are you going to do? Um, this is a, a tricky one. I, I feel like I run into some issues with the mystery, but I still liked it better than the last film. I still don't know if it warrants a higher star rating, so I think I'm still going to give it three stars in a heart, like I did another Thin Man. I just know in my heart it's slightly higher than that film. I think I gave another Thin Man three stars and a heart, too. You did. And this one is better than that one to me. Um, wait a minute. No, it's not to after the thin man what was the second one again these stupid movies after the, the thin, thin man, man was the second after one. another and you gave that i one didn't four. like yeah i gave that one four i'm gonna give with the this possibility one to go five it's leaning much harder that okay. that the second one is going to be a five-star film that's okay. where i am right now as of today four stars all right well, well that puts our letterbox rating at three and a half with a heart over at The Next Reel. And uh, as Pete said, don't forget to visit thenextreel.com slash letterbox. You can get your patron or pro membership. It works for renewals as well. Don't forget, we also have a membership. You can learn more at thenextreel.com slash membership. You get early access to all the episodes. Uh, members have bonus content at the uh, in each episode at the start and end. 
Uh, we do monthly member bonus episodes, all sorts of great stuff for our members. You can learn more, as I said, at thenextreel.com slash membership. So what did you think about Shadow of the Thin Man? We would love to know. Hop into the Show Talk channel over in our Discord community, where we will be talking this week about the movie. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. Letterbox give it, Andrew. As Letterbox always do it. How many lines is yours? One. Oh, I'm eight. Oh. Um, is that how we're like, how, how I think I'm gonna go. Your... I'm gonna go first because okay. one liners might be funnier, and mine is not funny. It's actually uh, serious. Oh my! I know. Uh, it's a three and a half star, watched by our dear friend and community member Stig. The titles have been, haven't made much sense after the second movie, but half of making a franchise, I guess, is having a recognizable name, isn't it? I feel there are more silly antics in this than the previous two, and the movie is better for it. Even if Myrna Loy and William Powell's expressions are starting to feel like presets they're pulling out from a well-known library, it still works. Loy is still the funniest one, and I'm glad she got a more active hand in detective work this time around. And Asta is even is ever helpful too, even though the effects to make Asta act feel pretty cheap. I didn't <laughs> mention the part about Asta and the baby and the bone. Uh, I thought that was a riot. <laughs> Did you wash your hands? That one? <laughs> yes. Uh, anyway. Hey, Thank you, Stig. That was three and a half. It boils down to how well is your dog trained? Yeah. I can't sure. get my dog to do that. Oh, no. <laughs> Did you wash no. your hands? <laughs> no. no. What do you got? I have a two star by Adam, who just has this to say. Those kids on the merry-go-round really got no chill. <laughs> <laughs> they were so mean. <laughs> they were the worst. They were oh, just a terrible bunch. They were like so stereotypes. Cool. Like, I feel like the major W.S. Van Dyke II. I feel like he has some <laughs> real issues to direct kids that way. Like, he has some some real children anxieties that this is how he directed those kids to behave as bullies. <laughs> uh, like, he, he, he has nightmares about these kids and he just put them on screen. That's pretty funny. This is his saw. Wow, there's a... Uh... An angle I had not thought of before, <laughs> but okay. Uh, thanks, Letterboxd. It is hard to believe we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. Oh, you're telling me. Producing this show week after week is so much fun, but it does require a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. The Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals links to the source material from all of our adapted film discussions. Purchasing through our links support the show at no extra cost to you. In season 12, the focus was big franchises and series. We covered both Paddington films, adapted from the beloved children's book character created by Michael Bond. Oh, I love those films so much. Hugh Grant is perfect. For our Pitch Perfect series, the first film was adapted from Mickey Rapkin's nonfiction book about collegiate acapella competitions. It's like a short story of my life, literally. I lived college acapella. Sing it, brother. I lived college acapella. <laughs> I didn't mean literally. <laughs> You know who you're talking to, right? The Twilight Saga dominated the season with five films adapted from Stephanie Meyer's vampire romance novels, Twilight, New Moon, Eclipse, and the two Breaking Dawn parts. Dominated with awkward romance and nonsense logic is more like it. <laughs> that too. Another Thin Man brought us back to Dashiell Hammett's only Thin Man sequel based on other Hammett material, The Farewell Murder, that wasn't just based on the characters from the first film. We talked about Train Spotting and its sequel, T2 Train Spotting, adapted from Irvine Welsh's novels. Ugh, I hate the sequel's name. I do too. And the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy, adapted from J.R.R. Tolkien's 
epic fantasy series. Love these. Extended editions all the way, baby. Plus, all the Mission Impossible films based on the 1960s TV series. And we've still got at least one more to go. Members got to hear us chat about The Hustler and The Color of Money, adapted from Walter Tevis's books. Get all of these books and more at our Originals page, thenextreel.com slash originals. Start your next read from the movies we've covered at thenextreel.com slash originals. Originals. 